Um, so yeah, so uh, thanks for your introduction. Uh, so I'm Joel Falcou, that's uh, the obvious things. Uh, as Andreas just said, so I'm mostly dealing with uh, C++ uh, in the context of C++ of parallel programming and high performance computing. Uh, and yeah, my, my main occupation is actually torturing compilers uh, that we will dig into uh, a bit later. Uh, so tonight I wanted to uh, speak about some kind of ongoing work we have uh, right now with my uh, research group on uh, actually trying to uh, see how a more modern take uh, over uh, C++ standards uh, can help us design um, the you know, everlasting um, dreaded matrix slash numeric table uh, types and how we found some interesting stuff uh, both new and old, and how C++ 20 and a bit of 17 uh, helped us going there. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, you can ask questions at any moment. Uh, what we do is that if uh, I can answer them, like, in a, in a short way, I will just answer them as the flow goes. And if not, I will just pin you back uh, at the end of each subpart so we can have a, some kind of interactive um, discussion going on. So uh, what what should we care about uh, all that? Uh, oh, it's not the correct window. Sorry for that. So a bit of, a bit of context quickly. Um, so yeah. So uh, why do we even care about dealing with arrays uh, as, a, as a computer scientist? Uh, it's more like we as computer scientists don't really care about that. It's much like other scientists actually cares. Uh, as you may know, computing uh, and uh, numerical simulation has replaced the classical scientific experiment in the uh, global uh, scientific process of uh, trying to do something, not understanding it, exposing your theory, and then doing science. And uh, the way that we shift to uh, a computing-based uh, science thing, uh, since a lot of time right now, uh, made um, something interesting that it turned uh, it turned com computers uh, actually into uh, time machines because the fastest you can compute, the fastest you get your results, the fastest you can see how and if and why you're wrong, okay? And so um, computing faster uh, means basically getting results earlier, okay? And um, it was okay while uh, the machine was simple and the problem was simple, uh, well, it didn't last. So. As the machine and the problem and the numerical algorithms uh, went um, for uh, a long time more and more complex, uh, there was a gap between what the computer could do, what the uh, numerician could write as an algorithm, and how the actual scientific users can use those machines. And um, users are actually scientists, but not necessarily computer scientists. So we need to find a way to, uh, you know. Uh, makes them feel, you know, uh, I would say that, not safe, but um, at home uh, with whatever tools we throw at them for doing their computation. And uh, one very simple data structure um, is a multidimensional array. I mean, uh, being two dimension, three dimension, uh, or too many dimension in some uh, physics uh, e problems. Um, it has to have some properties. Um, so we want it to be fast. Uh, for obvious reasons, we want it to be easy to use for our um, target audience, and we want it to be expressive. That means that we want people to be able to write uh, new things uh, in a way that feel intuitive and work as the, uh, the people uh, thought about them. So the question is, how do we write that? Well, uh, in a lot of different ways, actually. Um, and if we go on these very fine details, um, what, what do we mean by being fast? So uh, currently, this means that, well, uh, we need to account for uh, very complex hardware, being SIMD extensions, uh, GPGPU, or whatever uh, the current trend is. And uh, it should take them into account for very simple reasons that the abstraction we built on top of them should not hinder performances. I still have to get a nice uh, percentage of what my machine is supposed to give me. Uh, easy to use means that, as I said, it has to be intuitive for people that deal with numeric algorithms. And uh, we must protect the users from writing bad code. So 
write preventing users to write bad code that that, com that doesn't compile uh, we know how to do this but what we want to do is also to be able to say no you, you can't write that because if you do it uh, your performance will be bad so we want to shield them from um, those kind of performance anti patterns uh, and the expressivity size basically is that when you look at the numeric code it has to look numeric okay so the least amount of uh, let's say uh, you know like language-based um, boilerplates or whatever should be minimal. Uh, so people can look at the code and, and see what's going on. And as I said also, whenever you combine something that makes sense in your head, it should make sense for the library. Um, well, it has been going on for a while. Uh, I mean, from simple containers, like, like the standard vector and things, uh, we have span now, uh, we have a huge uh, proposal for MD span, which is basically a multidimensional span uh, we have Boost QVM, which is a, a very nice small library that uh, doesn't get the uh, publicity it should get. And if you go further than that, you, you have multiple more complex library based on this uh, very scary uh, expression templates things where uh, you write code that the compiler turns into some kind of um, IST at compile time, generate other codes, and uh, things go fast. There is a lot of them um, that I just dropped there from uh, another mm -hmm. random order. Uh, ranging from the, uh, I mean, from the ancestors of all the MOs, which is Blitz plus plus, to more, more known like I don't know Armadillo and other recent things. Um, so this is a lot. There is a lot of activities on this front. So uh, what we wanted to do is try to find a way to actually make make some progress on this front. So um, one thing we we encountered when we worked on those kind of problems before. Uh, is that when you deal with uh, multidimensional array abstractions that also happens to be um, an expression template system that also happens to be uh, something that do parallel programming and that happens to be to do probably something else, uh, at some point you end up cornering yourself into a very complex code base that um, doesn't support uh, complex evolution or complex rewriting. And we have been there already and we hit this kind of dead end probably twice. So we wanted to start a new, uh, with a new standard. And uh, one thing we really wanted to do is not getting cornered the third time. So uh, we wanted to separate the concern. So we want lazy evaluation. We want to have this multidimensional array things. Uh, we want to control the memory properly and we want to support the hardware. And so our master plan is basically to split everything into its own software component so we can reuse each of them uh, in different scenarios, or we can actually offer them to users without having to get the old package and prevent this monolithic, eff monolithic effect that you end up with a huge, I don't know, hundred of thousand lines of code that is very complicated to uh, move forward or, or make evolve. So what we decided to do is basically put a library on top of each of them. Uh, I've already made a talk about one of those, which is the lazy evaluation layer uh, at CPPCon 2019. You can go and check the video uh, if this one is too boring for you. Uh, so we, we already have a solution for this lazy evaluation things. So I won't be speaking about that uh, today. Uh, I will focus on these n, uh, n dimensional array things. So we will probably speaking 99% about uh, Kiwaku, which is the name of our library with a side uh, of our memory allocation things very, very quickly. And we will deal with the uh, support for hardware another time. So yeah, let, we'll get focused on this. What, what does it mean to have an ND array? Uh, what should I do to make it work properly? And uh, how can C++20 uh, help us doing this, form, doing this in, a, in a correct way in terms of amount of code and, uh, and abstractions and, and of course quality of uh, the generated code? So we go over that a bit. Uh, so first part would be about what, what we should be doing to, to build uh, these array classes. So the way I would be sp speaking about this is uh, following the same uh, stream of thought that we, uh, we went when we designed the uh, library and uh, trying to find whenever uh, something was a blockade and how we overcome these issues and how that turned into code. And then we will see what happens when we go from those uh, first principle uh, basic elements and we try to uh, build something that is usable uh, for people. 
So that's basically the plan for, for tonight. Okay. If you bear with me on this. So, uh, yeah. So there is math uh, in, the, in the talk. So uh, not much. Uh, should probably be okay. Uh, so if you have any intolerance, you, 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 you have to take your precaution for that. Uh, but I will try to be, to be gentle on this side. So uh, let's talk about what, what, what is an n-dimensional array? What, what are the basic things uh, we need to understand about the problem, which sounds easy, but it's not, and how we can build up uh, on this. So first, um, we have two main uh, drivers on this thing. Uh, we have the uh, performance driver, and we have the compile time performance driver. Uh, so we want the code to run fast, and we want the code to compile fast, or at least as fast as possible, okay? So we, we need to take something into account and we will work in a very specific subset for the, the context of this talk. Uh, some of those limitations act, are actually to be uh, lifted in the actual library, but uh, I wanted to have some things that fit in an hour, uh, in an hour slot, so let's go on that. So uh, we want to deal with uh, numeric types or aggregates of numeric types, so no polymorphic object. It's not a generic... Uh, vector. It's something to deal with numeric things. Uh, we assume that reallocation are few or far between. I mean, we can reallocate things, but it's not something we do uh, a lot. It's not It's not a container we do pushback all over again. I mean, we resize it somehow, and we work with the size we, we need, and maybe we will resize it later, but uh, it's not the main issue. Um, and so we also know that uh, the memory of our array must be as, as globally contiguous as possible to appease the cache. Uh, if it doesn't know already, uh, I mean, 99% of the performance of your, of your code right now is detected by the fact that you uh, use the cache properly, the CPU cache properly. And uh, as the, uh, the, the code is get more and more complicated, uh, we, we need to be very precise on what we do on this. So uh, one thing we won't be doing is this uh, classical vector of vector of whatever things that has all the bad properties we want to avoid. So uh, it's not globally contiguous. Uh, the initialization is complicated. Uh, resizing them is even more complicated. So we, we won't do that. Um, and then compile times. Yeah, uh, compile times is basically two things. Uh, the fact that we can uh, actually express all the options we want in, in a proper way in the type interface, but we don't want the type interface to be too big. We don't want to end up with uh, an array class with 10,000 different uh, template parameters that we have to remember the name and the, um, and the order and whatnot. We want to be flexible, but we have to have the least amount of impact on the type interface. Uh, we want to do uh, something which is very uh, important that we use as much as the instantiate types uh, as possible. So whenever the compiler can instantiate something, we want to reuse it as much as possible. And uh, it's a no old Baron library, so everything C++ 1720 uh, is fair game. Being if const expert concepts, uh, of, I mean, the, uh, expand, the expansion, validity expansion operator, whatever you name it, uh, if we need something, we use it. It's uh, it's it's a bleeding edge tool, and we, we use it as an exploration, uh, you know, uh, vehicle for that. So let's do some basic things. So what what's an array? An array is basically gathering data into a grid, and uh, we will do some assumptions that the number of effective dimensions is known at compile time. So you know that you have a three D array. Uh, one or multiple of each dimension can actually have one element, but it has three axes, if you, if you want. And the number of those dimension is fixed. Uh, you, can, you can vary the number of elements along each dimension, and it may be so that the number of elements along a given dimension uh, may be or is uh, required to be known at compile time. So we want to have, let's say, a dynamic or compile time uh, size for, for an array. And one thing that we need to be, be clear on that is that the initial ordering of those sizes, it's domain specific and arbitrary. So you may want to deal with images that has rows and columns in this order, or you may do, I don't know, um, signal processing where you have channels and, uh, and uh, frequencies or uh, frequencies and uh, phases or whatever. It's not 
just row and columns and depth. It's not in any particular order. So we will speak about dimension by numbering them. So we, we are not, you know, uh, tempted to, to think about rows or columns and, and make bad assumptions in that. So this is a four by three array. Uh, the dimension zero contains four elements. And I have three elements on the other dimension. That's the abstract view of what I am dealing with. So, uh, what should we do? Well, let, let, let's try to find a way to express all the variability of those shape or extent things. Uh, we want to be uh, storing as much information as we can about those size, their runtime or compile time in nature, and their value if needed. And uh, a classical approach, uh, which is basically just, uh, I just copied the, um, the MD span specification there, is you have an extent. Um, classes uh, that take a variadic number of uh, values. So you have as much values as you have the effective dimensions. And we have a special markup that means that this particular dimension is only known as, as runtime. So if you have an extent for three, that's a four by three uh, compile time extent. And you have, if you have an extent dynamic dynamic something, okay, it's, it's a runtime extent and you have to uh, build it with uh, with the actual uh, values there. And uh, if you have a very large number of dimension and they are all dynamic, you may end up with this dyne AD things, uh, which is just an extent of dynamic, 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 etc. So it's a bit cumbersome to, to use. And that's the classical things we, 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 we can have. So there's a bunch of small issues with that, especially in the API quality things. That's, uh, the type interface is a bit awkward. Uh, you don't really want to write array of float of extend and so on and so on and so on everywhere. Uh, it makes passing such array or such extent as a template parameters as a function a bit complicated. And you don't really want to write lines long aliases when you have a large number of dimension. And the implementation may or may not be efficient because um, you don't know how the actual um, uh, compile time or runtime properties of a dimension is actually uh, processed inside. So uh, the solution we were exploring was say, okay, but we want a compile time value. We want to have a size, uh, and we know that this size is four by three at compile time. But we already have something to express that. I just have to make a context per object that say my size is four by three. So we just construct a context per extent or shape and done. But yeah, but how can we actually pass that as a parameters to the array class? I mean, the array needs to know uh, it has a four by three uh, sizes and needs to know it in its type. Well, just use um, just use a regular um, things for that into the language. So uh, in C plus plus twenty, the notion of non-type template parameters got extended. You're probably familiar with uh, NTTP as we uh, most most of the time um, name them because you may already have encountered uh, simple stuff like STD integral constant that has a members which, uh, uh, sorry, a template parameters, which is uh, an integral value or, or STD array that takes its size as an integral value. So the classical cases of non-type type parameters are, as I said, so integral values like int or size T bool. Uh, any enumeration, which is very cool because you can have very expressive code there. And you have less classic cases uh, that you don't really want to go in, but it's possible. You can have pointer to functions, or you have pointers to uh, object with external linkage, uh, which is a bit more complex to ensure. Or you can just have a new PTR value in your template parameters. So that was what we can be doing with C++, let's say, 11 to 17. And uh, C++ 20 just say, you know what? As long as your type uh, is as no static data members and everything is public and uh, non-mutable, and uh, if all the type of your bash classes or your non-static data members are, are actually structures or aggregates thereof, well, you can take it and put it as a, a template parameters. Well, that means that you can write simple, simple code like this, for example, which is completely um, artificial. So you have a color structures, it has a RGB value and an alpha channel or whatever. 
and you can have a pixel that takes a color directly as um, as an entity P. And uh, for whatever reasons, you you have a display function that takes a screen uh, and the position, and you will light up the screen at a given position using the color of the pixels. But if you statically know that your pixel has an alpha which is equal to zero, you will just skip doing anything. So you can, if constexpr checks that um, the entity PC value dot a is not zero, is non zero, and then calls the whatever put pixel um, interface of screen. And then you can write instances of those pixel classes by saying, okay, it's a pixel of color something, something. Okay, so you have a bright red one and you have something which is, uh, has an alpha value of zero. So you know at some point time that it won't get displayed. So you can use arbitrary abstraction as complex as you need uh, because color there is not very interesting. It just, it's just an aggregate, but it could have had uh, its own, you know, methods or whatever constructors. Okay, and as long as those methods and constructors are constexpr, you can just pass them like this and do whatever you want. This means that what we need to do is build something that behave as a size um, type, which is constructible as an entity P. And whenever you pass something as an entity P, that's the static size. And, and if not, well, you will find the things at runtime. So we ended up with this um, API. So uh, we have this uh, small helpers, like this underscore 3D or 4D or whatever. Uh, just say, yeah, this is, this is a size with this much uh, effective dimension. So X is a 3D array, which is not initialized. Uh, y is a 2D array with a shape, which is four by three, but we use this off shape uh, pseudo construct of things. And the Z is a 4D array with sizes are four, three, one, two. That's the, uh, that's the basic API. And then if you go, if you want to go more uh, fine grain, uh, we have this extent construct of things when you can alternate uh, square brackets and parents so whenever you put the square brackets, you can fill in um, a static value, which will be the static amount of element on this dimension. When you pass a parent, it just says that this very dimension is actually dynamic. So A is a 3D array, uh, which has four elements on the first dimension, some amount on the second, you don't know, and three on the third one. And uh, how can I actually put some values there? Because I don't want to repeat the fact that I have a four and a three and something. So we have these axis things. Let's say, yeah, along axis one, which is a dimension number one uh, there. So this is this dimension actually, okay. Uh, I want you to put a six. And I don't have to give you all the other one because you know them statically. So just, you know, bear with me and just put that somewhere. So whenever you use this, uh, if your size is fully static, it doesn't consume any size in the array itself. And whenever you have some amount of dynamic uh, size in your shape, uh, you will consume the exact space you need to store them. So uh, the amount of space consumed by B to store its additional dynamic size is the size of a PTA DFT and not more. So all the funny things you can do is that as you can build, um, sorry, as you can build context per shape, you can actually start writing a shape there like S. So this is a 2D extent. That's basically what this thing is. And then later on, you can tack on other information. So you could have say, I have an array of shape S and later on, I want to have an array of shape S bracket 10, which is a 3D array that has the same size as S followed by a third dimension of 10 elements. So you have a way to um, partially and uh, incrementally build your context per shape this way. So that was the basic idea of the API. Uh, we rely extensively on uh, C++20 and TTP to do this. Uh, all the other cool things are basically written using uh, either inline variable traits or using uh, you know template variable and stuff like that. So it's pretty much um like like a free game after that as, as soon as we have defined the thing so we will keep uh we will keep an eye on that we come back on this later 
So now the question is, okay, I know how many elements I have, how many dimensions, how, how they are set up. Uh, what can I do? Well, it would be cool if I can actually put something into um, uh, an element of my array, okay? And uh, I want to access my array using its indexing uh, things, and I want to... Uh, okay, I have a question, uh, which is actually interesting. So why empty parents instead of anything else? Uh, you cannot... I could have gone with, like, say, uh, thanks, Nebath, uh, for the question. I could have gone with uh, empty square brackets, except you cannot have multiple empty square brackets, and you cannot have them every place you want, okay? And it's very complicated because extent is a custom types, and you cannot actually have an empty square brackets uh, on the custom types. It has to be on the, as, a, as the last one because it will be interpreted as a pointer, so it was a bit, uh, you know, like awkward. Uh, the other thing we were considering was having square bracket with something like dynamic, with, with a value that says this value is dynamic, just skip over. Uh, but it was a bit wordy. Um, so for now, we go with uh, parents, which is the closest thing uh, we can control that looks like a square, an empty square bracket. Uh, the plan is later on, uh, there is a proposal to um, make it so you can have um, a, um, multiple parameters into square brackets. Uh, and when this thing lands, uh, we will have to see if we can reuse it. Like, for example, if you have multiple um, multiple consecutive static size, and uh, we can see if we can actually have a way to say, I have actually zero parameters to square bracket. And in this case, when we will be able to do that, yeah, so the parents will probably just be empty brackets, which make more sense. Uh, I don't know if it's answer your question, Nebaf. Probably. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so yeah, it's and as I said, it's it's a very open-ended thing for now. Um, so we uh, we can discuss that later on. I mean, we, we are very open to have discussion about the look and feel of the API because uh, for now, I mean, as we see there, there is a lot of things that simply you don't have many much, you know, um, choices to do. But on things like that, yeah, we can actually do that. But what we wanted to have, have something which is very, uh, very intuitive. And uh, I will speak later about why we still want to have uh, parents, but it's something for just after that. So uh, yeah, I have an index, and I want to go into a memory block somewhere and find um, and find my value. So you have an array. It, it's a one D case. That's the trivial cases. Okay. So you have S zero elements. A B is the first valid index of A. So your and your array can be indexed from zero. Uh, if you do C or C plus plus, it can be indexed by one. If you do uh, you know like serious numeric stuff in Fortran or MATLAB. Uh, but you, you could have a base index, which is like, I don't know, like minus 5 or 17 or whatever. So we have a B, which is the first valid index of your array. And I is the index of any element in the array. So it's, it's basically uh, stranded between B and uh, B plus S0 excluded. So when you want to access this, it's trivial. You take your index, you, you subtract the base index, and you have your address uh, offset that you had to the, to the pointer to the data. That, that's trivial. No, nothing to see there. Uh, when you start to have more dimension, it starts to be a bit more um, funny for some definition of funny. So you have a S0 by S1 element. Again, completely domain specific slash arbitrary ordering of the dimension there. Okay. So you need two indexes, I0 and I1, to uh, access any element in A. So both elements are in their uh, respective range. Okay. So B0 plus S0, B1 plus S1. And so we have to do some uh, calculations. So we can say that we we do I0 minus B0. So we uh, put everything back to 0 for the first index. Uh, we do the same for the second index, I1 minus B1. And uh, we know that we need to jump above that amount of full uh, number of elements in the dimension 0. So for example, there, we have this array. So we have a base index 1 on this dimension and 0 on the others. Um, so the dimension goes this way for this one and uh, 0, 1, 2 this way. So if we go to this one, which is 3, 1, so that's, that's the time I checked that I didn't 
uh, botch my uh, my diagram, you know. So, <laughs> so this one is uh, base index one. So these three get subtracted by one. So give us a two. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and so we have this one, which is one minus zero. And so we know that we have to jump all those things. So there is four of them plus zero, one, two. So we end up at uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. That looks like I didn't mess it up. Okay. Uh, and so you know that you have to go to offset six. Okay. Uh, it's a bit of the gymnastic. And, um, well, the question you can ask is, yeah, but why do we do it this way? Because I can totally do it the other way around, like starting by um, walking down the I1, jumping some amount of S1, and uh, the amount of S1 I, I jump is given me by the I0 index. In this case, if I do the same computation, just swapping the things, okay, which, if I'm not mistaken, is correct. So it's 1 minus 0 is 1, plus 3 times 2. So it's 6 plus 1, it's 7. And indeed, we jump 1, 2 full block of 3, and plus 0 plus 1, and we are there. But now we are at memory index 7. OK, so I assume most of you know about this issue, that we need to choose. We need to choose an ordering of our dimension because both are right. It's just that the logical dimension that we use to abstract our array, well, it's just logical dimension. It's arbitrary. We can just name them as we want. But when we want to put them into memory, we need to choose an ordering as, as soon as you have more than one dimension. The one dimension cases is trivial anyway. And this dimension ordering has far-reaching consequences, uh, which means that uh, you need to know which ordering you are using. If not, you are going to walk down your data in a way which are which is not as a correct way to do it. You need to go down your data in an increasing monotonous unix strided uh, path. You need to go to address zeros and ones and two and so on. So if you start jumping all the way through lines, your performance will be bad. And the question is, which order is right? And the answer is, they are all right. It just depends on what you want to do and what you want to express. This means that we need to have a way to choose these things. So this logical versus physical implementation things um, that we need to uh, define is what we call a storage order. And the storage order is basically a permutation of logical dimension that maps them onto the physical representation that we have into memory. You basically choose that if you have a four by three array, for example, you can choose to store all the fours, one after the other, so you have three blocks of fours, or you could store all the other dimension first, so block of three after block of three in the linear memory space. It's a still a four by three element, uh, sorry, a four by three array, but you choose to store it in some way or another. And the way you store them can actually uh, be uh, dependent on the application, on which other language you want to interface with. Because some language has, let's say, a preferred orientation with respect to their native array. You may, err, you may have heard that C or C++ is a row major language, and Fortran is a column major um, language or the other way around i never know uh doesn't matter so that's not the point c native array are row major and fortran native array are call major but if you allocate a bunch of data in your memory you can decide how i mean how the uh, physical order would translate into the uh, logical order and vice versa so we we need a way to specify uh, or not, actually, uh, how the logical data get translated into uh, the logical dimension, sorry, get translated into uh, a physical ordering of, of element in the memory. So we have a storage order classes, but you need to pass a permutation. Problem, you could actually pass a permutation by enumerating the order of dimension, like, uh, I don't know, like con measure could be one, zero, two, three. But what happens if you have more than four dimensions? What happens if you have less? 
you cannot just pass values as the order. You cannot just pass an arbitrary permutation. You need to pass a function that computes this permutation. And you want this permutation to be computed at compile time because it will impact the way we loop over the data. Well, NTTP is at it again because you can actually now write a context per lambda and uh, pass it as a template parameters. Uh, this is doable because now you can actually have um, auto as uh, a type of a non-type parameters. So you don't have to care about the act actual type of your lambda. So I can just say that the storage order is something that takes a permutation as a parameters and it has a value internal uh, template uh, variable that takes i and n. So i is a current dimension you want to order and n is a number of dimension you are currently ordering. It may be interesting to have uh, n because sometimes you want to do some kind of complex permutation and just having the index of the, uh, of the dimension is not enough. And so we can decide that, for example, the C ordering is basically uh, whenever you go dimension 0, 1, 2, 3, you store them 0, 1, 2, 3. It's arbitrary. And you can say that, well, if I'm in fourth in ordering, well, um, for every dimension after the second one, it's in the same order than it should be. But I permute the dimension 0 with dimension 1. And you can just slap this lambda directly into the storage order de definition. So that's something you can pass as basic storage order. You can define your, your own. Uh, we should probably have uh, some kind of, you know, like uh, pseudo constructor thing so you doesn't have to, to write it this way. But this just works. You, you pass a lambda. All lambda are context pairs in C17 if they are actually context per inside. Uh, they are structure. They have no. They, they fulfill all the uh, NTTP extended cases, so you can just uh, put them there. And uh, it's it's far superior to just passing a pointer or function or whatever. You just you just pass it there. It just works. So let's go for storage order. So we can decide which way we want to access uh, a point in our array depending on the ordering of the indexes. Yeah, okay, now uh, if I go 3D and I go back to some arbitrary ordering because it's not actually an issue now, well, it starts to be uh, a bit complicated to uh, to go through all those jumps, okay? This is a naive way to uh, actually do this. Okay? You just keep piling dimensions. So we need to find a way to uh, generically compute that depending on the arbitrary number of dimension. And uh, we need to find a way to express this pseudo recursive nature of computation. Well, a classic implementation is just that. Uh, so I, I hope the uh, other side is OK, yeah, probably. Uh, they look OK on my screen, so it should be OK. So you have a linearized index function that takes an array of dimensions. We simplify the issues. And the viadic number of indexes. Uh, we grab the data from the, uh, the array, and we jump into the other one. So if you have a, a single, if you have a single um, dimension, you just return the index. And uh, if you have more than one, well, you, you take the one you have and you add uh, the number of dimension you currently have times, uh, oh, okay, there is an error. So this is obviously near linearized index. Sorry for that. You call back the same function by shifting the dimension and eating up the remaining indexes. So we will recursively uh, unroll this I0 plus S0, I1 plus S0, S1, I2, and so on and so on. Uh, it works. Uh, the generated code is OK. Um, the compile time is bad. The compile time is bad because we do the one thing you shouldn't be doing with Viadic templates. You do recursions. And you never, ever want to recurse on a Viadic template parameters. Recursing on the uh, on the valid template parameters, sorry, uh, leads to uh, a code that need to at, at some point generate all the intermediate symbols and consume a lot of compile time. So we need to do better. And the other way of uh, seeing that's bad, in these cases, I don't handle the uh, the base index because I wanted the code to be uh, readable on on the sides. But you see that if you have to pass the uh, base index, uh, you will have to do one subtraction per dimension, and it starts to pile up a bit. So we need to think about it in another way. Let's have a look back to what we wrote a bit there. So that's, that's the point where if you are intolerant to math, you probably have to look away. So we have this S0, S1, Sn-1 uh, array. 
we have a set of index i0, i, n minus 1. And let's phi be uh, this uh, linear, uh, linear index to address function. So we take the, all the index, all the size, and we know that we have to do this. Now, if we introduce this time once there, okay, well, it looks like the sum of product, which is also known as a dot product. We are basically computing the dot product of every indexes with this thing, which is a cumulative product of all dimensions that we call a stride. That's the strides of the array. That's how many uh, value I need to jump on a given dimension to get to my next contiguous value in this dimension. So in the inner dimension, you want to jump one after the other, so it's one. We saw that in 2D, we need to jump S0 value every time on the second dimension, and S0 times S1 on the third, and so on and so forth. The cool thing is that this value is trivially computable from the shape. It, it's the cumulative product of the shape. So as soon as we have the shape thing, we can derive the strides, and the cool thing is that if we have a, a context per or partially context per size, we can build a partially context per strides. So we can actually store the least amount of data for that. And one very important thing is that we need to know where and if we have actually one of those strides, which are equal to one, what we call the unit stride, because if we know that a given value in the stride array is unit, that we know that we don't even have to do the, uh, the multiplication. We can just keep it. And it's very important to know if the innermost dimension, the first dimension, is associated to a unit stride. That's very important. Uh, the stride, as I say, can be runtime or compile time or both, just like the, uh, the size. Okay. And uh, we, we use a very similar API to, uh, to the shape. I will just take the time to look at the implementation. So let's see if it doesn't. Ah, that's not the, uh, okay, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, <laughs> not at all. Okay, let's do it another way because, yeah, that's look better. Is it? Is it? Okay, so I um, uh, probably need to zoom a bit more, I guess. Let's, let's zoom a bit. Yeah. So, um, so that's the uh, shape thing we, we spoke about. Okay, so uh, as I said, all these 1, 2D, 2, 4D are basically extended with the appropriate number of empty parents. Uh, we have an ND version I didn't present that basically computes uh, the proper number of closing parents you need to get N dimension. So that's uh, that's a trivial thing. Uh, the stride class is interesting because it depends on the number of dimension of the shape. Okay, And uh, it also depends on something which is this a strange type, which is the unit indices. It's, uh, it's a list of integral values, like uh, in index sequence, for example. And the uh, static value you have there locates the index of the unit strides. And whenever you ask for the value of a stride using the get function, well, you can ask the uh, unit indices type if it contains the actual um, index you need. And if it contains it, that means that it's actually an, uh, a unit index. So it just returns a one as an integral constant. And if not, it can ask the unit indices type list to compute where in the runtime array is actually the if uh, value of the stride. So we have some kind of a compressed uh, array uh, storage that say, if you know that this or that index uh, has a static value, well, I just don't store it. I will just return it from the uh, from the static value themselves. And if not, I can compute where you should be looking for the value you need to do this. It has a very uh, strong implication, which is that the you can read a stride, you can construct a stride, but you cannot change the value of any element in a stride after construction, because this thing cannot be made uh, non const for reasons. So we have a way to say, if I know something is unit, I don't store it. Something we will be reusing for the shape, because the shape doesn't want to store uh, its um, 
its static value. So uh, this is built onto uh, a bunch of type list threads. Uh, it's actually not that big. And so we can actually uh, do something like this. If I go back there, oh, no, sorry. Wrong file, correct files. Yep. So the shape itself um, is parameterized by the uh, the type we built, this extend thing. It's itself an NTTP to the shape things. Uh, it can ask how many size, how many dimensions the shape contains. And it has these size map things that locates where the static index are. And so we know that the amount of data we need to store is the number of dimension minus the number of things stored as uh, a static values. So that's the only thing you need to store into the actual storage types. Uh, if we don't have any other indication, if you build a shape, you know that the associated stride type will be what we call a unit stride, uh, which is basically a type there for a stride of some amount of dimension, and I have a zero somewhere. Uh, my first dimension, zero, is, is unit. OK. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, things that we can know if it's completely static and so on. And everything inside is basically built on the fact that we need to know if something is dynamic or not. So that's basically the only abstraction we need. So as soon as we have a way to say, I can build a shape, const expert time, run time, or both. And this thing can be translated into those stride things, probably using a storage order to know where the things are. Uh, we can handle all the cases of what we want to do uh, using um, these uh, storage things. So where is the slide? So this is the slide back. So yeah. So th this notion of being able to uh, know at compile time where the data is living, uh, help us actually write uh, a very concise code. Everything is basically handled by this uh, index list things. And uh, we can use the rest of the API of the shape and of the stride types like, like a regular tuple. Okay, just you, you have get, uh, you can uh, structure bind it and so on. The only thing is that you, you cannot uh, dynamically access anything. Well, but we forgot about Baz index. It sounds kind, kind of important because we saw that with a classical thing, uh, the code was bad because we, we, we may end up with as much subtraction into the index com uh, computation that we have dimensions. But, well, math again. If I write the uh, naive way of computing the size, that I know that I need to do the dot product of I0 minus B0, I1 minus B1, and so on, dot product the stride array. And by the power of you know subtraction distribution is basically I0, I1, IN times the stride plus minus all the base index dot the stride again which basically is saying I'm computing the index, like, uh, I mean, the uh, the value where directly the index. I compute the value as if the index were the base index, and I subtract the first from the second, which means that the base index, in fact, is actually a constant value. Okay, I know how many uh, elements I need to jump, but I don't need to store it because I can just take this constant value and shift the, uh, the, the pointer to the data by this amount. So whenever I access the index given by this part of the formula, right, uh, I will fall onto the proper thing, which means that you will pay for handling the base index only when you construct the array or when you destruct it, because you will need to shift the pointer back to where we should be destroyed. But whenever you handle, uh, you access a value, you never have to compute all those subtractions. So that's one, you know, uh, one hit for the stride things. And those stride things is something which is quite old. We didn't invent anything there. Uh, we just tried to work on the implementation in a meaningful way. I mean, that's basically what um, a lot of photon based library does. That's what things like uh, Boost Multi Array does. That's probably what MDSpan is doing, if I remember correctly. If not, well, we, we have some issues. 
Um, so the strike gives us that, and we will see that the strike-based implementation of ND array will give us another uh, three bytes a bit later. So we have this shape option we, from which we can derive a stride for which we can have a storage order options and everything is manageable as a whole that we can actually say, yeah, this is the way I, I build and I design my array logically for the, from the shape and physically using the storage order. So we end up with this single function. So we have the uh, strides, we have the indexes, uh, and we do this uh, little uh, viadic things using a lambda, uh, taking an index sequence to go down all the uh, stride time index product sum, okay? Uh, using a fold expression and using um, uh, immediately called lambda taking an index sequence. So this will basically run down um, all the strides and indexes and do the computation. And the cool thing is that we don't do recursion there. We, we have a linear expansion uh, using the fold expression. So it means that we we only compile this once for a given amount of dimension. So uh, whenever you have one, two, three, or I don't know how many different uh, number of dimension, you will just compute uh, the code for this function once, uh, leading to a better compile time, less, less symbols to be handled, and so on. Well, so. Uh, we took a bunch of time dealing with this um, size and shape things. Uh, it, well, it's a very important uh, point because uh, the quality of the design after that uh, all depends on the flexibility of these things. There is a lot of different way to do uh, this kind of uh, abstractions. Uh, we went for a true and tried uh, abstraction, these tried things, the storage order permutation, uh, which is basically what you find back in a lot of, um, I mean, uh, ancient uh, lore about multi-dimensional array. Uh, you have a different way of doing this. Uh, if you are interested, you could have a look at the iLeaf uh, array, which is a, a bit more complex, uh, in which you you have a recursive descent of pointer arrays. It has other uh, benefits, but uh, it doesn't scale well after two, uh, after three or four dimensions. So we went for that. Okay, we have a way to say my array is this way and uh, this big and whatnot. Uh, but okay, wh wh what we, we need more than that. Uh, we need to tackle the issues of storing the data somewhere. And uh, a regular um, API uh, requirement, which is I need to be able to slice my array somehow. I, I mean, I need to have subarrays or I need to view an array in a different shape or something like this. And I want it to be as free as possible. So we go over those, uh, those problems. And the one way we, uh, we thought about that is, uh, let's go back to the simplest things. The simplest thing is when you don't have to allocate memory, it's basically building a view or a span, like uh, the standards call it. Uh, you have a bunch of pre-existing memory, and you want to look at it as if it was some kind of array with a shape and a storage order and whatnot. So we just you just want to wrap existing memory that can come from wherever and just say now it's an ND array. And you want to have those views to be as small as possible in what I call their resting position. That means that when you have a, a, a view built, the amount of memory the view itself uh, uh, occupies, not the data, just the view itself, has to be as small as possible. In a perfect world, those views should have a size which is exactly equal to the size of a single pointer. Or in the cases you need to have dynamic shapes, you need to have a size which is basically the pointer plus whatever integral value you need to um, store the shape and the strides. But if you have a, if you have a static view, like uh, you know that your array is nine element, okay, and it's over there, uh yeah yeah i have a camera sorry for that you know <laughs> so if you know that you, the size is fixed and the pointer is over there you just just consume the space for uh for the pointer uh that's something that came came about a long uh a long number uh, a various number of times sorry uh on twitter i don't know if you follow the uh occasional uh, discussion about uh, C++ developers and uh, C++ game developers. One thing uh, that was actually uh, um, um, 
The disadvantage of span is that when you have a span, uh, the size of the span is not as small as you may think. So it's very important to have the smallest thing. So we, we see how we can do this. And once we have view, we have array because array is just a view over some memory that the array owns. So you will allocate some memory, take care of the memory uh, ownership properly. And then you don't have to do anything because you will just say that you are a view on yourself and you will reuse all the API exposed by view. And you don't have to write any much more things than ending the ownership, setting up the view and be done. And again, the resting position size, that's what happens when you have an array of a given number of dimension over some types and uh, you just default constructed it, how, how big it is. We also, we, we also want to be able to say that this memory either live on the stack or on the heap through the use of some allocator. So we want to be able to have both at the same time. So the one thing we need to do is to have a proper way to uh, define uh, efficient and hold whatever efficient means, views. And all once we have those views, the arrays just follows. So let's have a look at that. So we have extent, which is an option. We have stride, which is dependent on the extent, on the shape, but it could be an option somehow. We we'll see that later on. Uh, we have the storage order. And uh, so I didn't speak about them right now because it's more of uh, something from the our, our other allocator library. Uh, you may want to pass the allocator types or the allocator value uh, to the construction. Uh, so we have a lot of options. You could have a view with a size, you can have a view with a size and the storage order. Uh, you can have a size with a storage order, uh, a, a static size and, and an allocator uh, also, or, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's kind of uh, design where you can actually manage options on your types. Uh, what we call policy-based design. So you have policies that say this is how you should handle the memory. This is how you should um, uh, you should handle the uh, how to say that the um, the storage order. This is allocator. This is a, and so on and so on. Um, you can decide there is an order for those policies, but then whenever you want to have a default value somewhere, it will be awkward because you will have to put everything up to the default. Maybe you will need to put the default anyway because you want to have something afterwards. So you, we want to have something that say, okay, you get, just put the options, you don't care, and we do the reordering ourselves inside. So the idea is to have a valid template type that just say, okay, this is all my, uh, this is all my uh, my options, right? And uh, I put them into a box, okay, uh, that I can um, ask question later. So you don't have to care about the um, ordering of the uh, of the options, right? Uh, you just need to know that uh, if I ask for this kind of options, what happens if it's there? What happens if it's not? Do I have a default? And then we can do this. And this option things uh, requires to be able to store. Okay, so uh, we have a question which is a bit more complex. So uh, I will answer that a bit afterwards. Uh, but the short, the short answer is we are working on it, but I will dip into the details afterward if you don't mind, okay? So um, what I was saying, oh yeah, yeah. So the uh, things, um, so the thing. So we will just pass options. And uh, we, what we want to be able to do is that we have uh, kinds of options, like this is the, uh, shape options, this is the stride options, this is the allocator option or whatnot. And uh, from this type, we want to get the value, knowing that the value can actually be a contextual value. So this is how it looks on the, uh, on the uh, view front. So you have this uh, type auto dot 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 options things. So all our options are actually again, context per NTTP object. All of them. The only type parameter we have is the actual data type. So we take this variadic amount of options and we shove it into what we call a settings object that basically build um, some kind of map at compile time between the type of the options and the value of the options. Uh, without going into too much detail, we can have a look at that afterward if you want. 
uh, it's basically using a variation of the uh, overload traits for visitors. I, we are aggregating contextual lambda that take uh, the option type as parameters and returns a proper option value. So we can put into the settings as much as option as we want. Uh, we have a compile time check that checks that we don't put twice the same option. Okay. And after that, we have a bunch of functions, those options dot dot uh, con con, sorry, uh, something that takes those settings things and extracts the value. So for example, when I got all my options, I need to get the shape option from the settings. And the shape option from the setting is this extend thing we saw already. And we just put it into a shape and instantiate it in the context per object. So we know what kind, what kind of shape it is. Once we have our shape, we can check if we have any stride options. But if we have none, we will just compute them from the actual uh, shape, shape settings. So if you don't pass any stride options, we will just say, okay, the shape is 4D, we need a 4D unit stride, done. And uh, as we have those objects as contextual value, and we can use them to ask questions about uh, properties of the options. So uh, you don't have to know uh, which option is put in which orders. Uh, you put them as you want, and uh, the view classes just extract them uh, when they need them. Um, a quick test shows that this uh, overload looking like uh, settings things um, cost a bit of compile time as soon as you go over uh, roughly 25 options, uh, which is, I hope, uh, enough for what we need. Um, but yeah, it's actually fairly, uh, fairly fast to compile and it doesn't, it has a nice um, sublinear growth in terms of compile time. So let's go back to the uh, question from uh, Zavi Bonaventura. So can we actually choose the actual uh, data structure instead of just having, let's say, uh, a pointer to something? Uh, currently, no. Uh, but uh, the design is made so that we exactly know where to put it. So one thing we can do is to say, we can have an option which is like, um, this is the way I want to structure my data, OK? Uh, we can probably uh, have to specify a, um, a type interface for these things. And we can just say, okay, just pass me um, a context per representation of what you want. And then if this kind of option is there, then I will use it to uh, do my constructions, okay? And if it's not there, we will just go back and use the default things we, we, we want to use right now. Um, now, uh, I have to be completely honest with you. Um, we know that we need to have a way to support efficient sparse matrices. Uh, that's one of our end game goal with this. Uh, currently, we are still experimenting uh, because the number of designs that you can actually show that this problem is huge. Uh, but yeah, that's something we want to do. Uh, but one thing we learned from our previous try um, we are not really sh we are not yet sure uh, if it has to be an option into views and, uh, and and arrays, or if we should have a sparse something next to them, which has the exact same behavior, the exact same support of option, except it statically knows it's sparse. So we can actually uh, do more optimizations and just relying on on the parameters that you have to to, to pass and so on. Um, the option way to do it is probably interesting because you could actually say uh, there is multiple way to store uh, sparse matrices. Yeah, so you have, uh, I mean, uh, different uh, storage for that. Uh, some are more uh, efficient for different cases. So instead of just having to say uh, my matrix, my array is dense or my my array is sparse, we can actually say okay, it's sparse using this storage or this other one and so on. So it has this interesting behavior that you could actually say, instead of choosing a single uh, sparse matrix representation, uh, you, you can just have an open door, uh, give one for now, and uh, if someone needs another one, uh, we have a protocol to follow to build another one. So we, we still need to investigate the pro and cons of both um, uh, design. There's a fixed one and the still driven by option ones. Uh, but that's something we definitely have on our roadmap because uh, 
our previous numerical library uh, didn't have it, and it was a huge liability for being used by more than uh, what we had as a as a number of um, users. So, and it was very complicated to piggy back uh, afterwards. So, we are definitely going to have a look at that. Yes. Uh, so, we, I will speak about that a bit later again uh, because I will point you where the thing is. So, let's go over because I'm already over time. Uh, so. Compile time issues, yes. So um, you have all those huge amount of options. Uh, you don't want to shove them all at once into a single type because if you do this, the number of symbols you will have to compile will basically depend on the number of types you in, you instantiate. So what you want to be able to do is split the concerns about each of your options and use them in a specific uh, split, uh, separated classes that will only handle something. So we know that the memory only depends on the type because that's the, the, the information you need to allocate the memory, okay? And the data access things depend on the strides and the shape. So we use this scary uh, approach. So scary is something that came from the uh, C++ core guidelines, uh, T61, yeah, T61. Uh, so basically say you don't have, you, you should not over parameterize your, your template members. So what we did is we split the main class in a, a bunch of small base classes that has less template parameters and just deal with one uh, point of the issues. So we have a view span thing that only depends on type. Uh, and so we just will be dealing with memories. And we have a view access classes that we just handle the computation required to find a value uh, somewhere. So the view class basically turns up like this. So yeah, the joke with my coworker is that when you look at this, you, you know why it's called a scary implementation, you see. So <laughs> we have a bit more things going on, okay? So uh, I inherit from this view span of pointer to types, and I inherit from this view access of a bunch more things. So I need to grab the shape, and I need to grab the associated strides. And uh, because I don't want to die, I just make a, temp a type def later on, on those base things. Okay, so we, we know what's going on. And uh, each of those classes just do whatever they need to do. So view span, well, view span is basically a simple wrapper around a pointer uh, on which you can change the pointer whenever you want. Uh, it supports pointers, pointer to cons, because the way we design it, you don't care about the, the constantness of the pointer. So one thing you can do, if you want to view to some floating points value, but you want the view to be uh, non-mutable on the data, you can just ask for a view of float const, and it will just work. So you can have a view of float, you can have a view of float and the view is const. So you cannot change the view, but you can change whatever you have inside the view. But you can also have a view of float const. So you can change the view, but you cannot change the value you are looking at. So basically view as a pointer-like uh, semantic. View access wraps the shape, wraps the stride, and uh, it provides these linearized function things. And it's easily optimized using requires clauses on the fact that a given size or shape is actually static. So whenever we can detect that the stride or the size is fully uh, defined at compile time or partially defined at compile time, we have a specific implementation. And this thing is very interesting because if we know that everything is const expert, we just need to store the shape so we don't store it. That means that the size of a view of any kind of const expert size is exactly the size of a pointer, no more, no less. If you have a dynamic sizes, then you will start having to store the data. But then we look at how many size, how many dimensions the size has, how many unit stride you have in your strides, and we only store the least amount of integers. Because if you don't, if you know that your innermost dimension has a unit stride, you don't need to store the one. And uh, you you will only need to store. Uh, the first try, but the first try is equal to the first size. So you don't need to duplicate it. So you just store everything after the second one. So we have a specific implementation for 1D shape, 2D shape, and all the other cases. 
And the cool thing is that when you look at a view, the, the resting size of a view is basically the size of a pointer plus um, two integers per dimension. So your um, except for 1D, okay. Oh, yes, uh, I will show that right now. So I will ask about what kind of optimization. So let's have a look at that rather quickly. Okay, where is me thick? Okay, so let's have a look at, oh, sorry, bad eyes. Where is there? Okay, blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's not there, oh, it should be there. Okay, anyway, it's not there. Let's have a look at view access. So view access is this base class we, we saw. So uh, we have a shape and a stride. And whenever we know that the shape is completely static, we doesn't need to store the shape. There is no member there. There is nothing there. Um, we need to have the size, okay, the number of the complete number of elements. Uh, we need to access the shape and we need to access the stride. So we just have those uh, things just have those member functions. And uh, we have the linearized uh, thing, which is, let me check, just there, which is just call the stride and say, give me the index associated to all of this. But we don't store anything. It's not even an empty base optimization. There is nothing in this uh, in these view access cases. So we don't store anything. So when you aggregate this view access and the view span, your view is basically the size of a pointer. Now, if I have a 1D shape with a unit stride, but it's not fully static, okay, the expected size of is the size of the pointer and the size of the one size we need to, to, to store. And we only need to store one thing, which is the size, the 1D size, because it will play the role of uh, the, the shape itself and the, 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 uh, the shape uh, doesn't need anything to compute. Uh, where is it? Where is index? Index is there. I don't even need it for computing my index, but I need to store it because I want to return it. Okay. So we just store the shape, which is a single, uh, it's a single integer. When you go to 2D things with a unit stride, okay. So again, uh, we are making this requires thing work a lot. Okay. So I'm not fully static. My static size, so the number of dimension is two, and my stride is unit. I need to do a bit more than that. So I need to store a bit more, but I don't need to store the full shape and the full strides because the full strides is useless. I am 2D, so the only thing I need to store is the, the number, the total number of elements because that's the one thing I cannot compute from the shape, but I don't store the full uh, array of the strides. And I just use whatever I need to compute the index either as a 2D or 1D access. And then again, if I have an ND shape, okay, uh, with unit stride, okay, with N bigger than two, what I do is that I only need to store two less values because all the others will be stored uh, next to the strides. And so what we store is that we just store, uh, well, sorry, so the one of you, I need, I need to have the number, I need to have the shape, and everything else is in the stride. So in every case, I only store the um, exact amount of integral values I need to do all the index shape and stride computation. And when the shape is completely static, I don't even store anything because everything is in the NGTP. So uh, it's not that per se it gives me a huge amount of optimization because at some point I will need to do this, you know, linearize things, okay? But it helps us optimize the amount of space that we consume as an overhead on top of whatever we have a view to. So that's the kind of thing we can do there. So it's basically not much. I mean, it's, it's a game of computing some size, check that at compile time it fits some scenarios, and dispatching using requires on the structures. Um, I don't know if there is a concept uh, aficionados in the, in the audience, but yeah, I'm using requires with uh, a bit of a very, uh, how to say that, plebeian uh, way of doing it, uh, because currently we are not still sure what, what kind of concept we want to put on there and if it actually requires to be a concept. 
So uh, most of our requires in this case are basically uh, Boolean requires. As I probably know there is a concept that needs to pop out of this and that will probably be a good way to, uh, how to say that, to uh, grab all of this into something more meaningful. But this is exactly the kind of thing we do. We can actually uh, shave off extra data uh, stored next to the view, okay? Uh, so whenever we uh, actually build a view, it's uh, the smallest amount of overhead in terms of uh, data next to the pointer. And that's very important because for the static case, okay, thank you, no problem. Uh, for the static case, when you know all your size, there is no, uh, there is no reason why your view should just be the size of a pointer. Because when the view, as complicated as it is, is just as big as a pointer, that means that you can start doing something very interesting. You can pass your view by value with no penalty. Because it just fits into a register. And from there, all the other things just go far better. OK? So that's the kind of thing we can do. Um, let me check quite, quite quick if I have any other things that I can have up there. Uh, no, probably not. So let's, no, so let's go back to the slides. Sure. So requires computation of properties of the shape in terms of dynamicity or uh, context per nation, how many things, uh, what are the strides and so on. So that's very important because we can actually have all those shrinking effects on the resting size. And now, as I say, an array is a view of where it serves. So we will just own some memory somehow, either via the stack, if the size is fully static, or via an allocator. So um, again, we could have say, uh, my array uh, just stores the data in its own pointers and it has a size, and then I build a view on top of that. But then again, we will be duplicating the pointers and we will be duplicating the, uh, the size because the view already has this information. So the view wrapper just say, yeah, I'm a view. And it happens that you will just allocate your data directly into my pointers. And you will be uh, responsible of ending the ownership. So we need a wrapper around two things, the automatic storage memory, which is basically an array, and something that will just enter the ownership of the pointer, which is stored inside the view. And we look at the type at the size of the shape and the stride, and we will decide where the data lives. So it basically looks like this. So we have this, uh, we have this array things first. Okay, so, uh, so this is the view things, it's exactly what we, oh, come on. Exactly what we saw a bit earlier, okay, with more things. And basically the array is somehow similar, but it uh, it's based on this storage selector things. The storage selector takes types, takes all the options, and it will decide how the data is managed. And if you look at there, you have information about, am I a dynamic thing? So is, my, uh, is my size dynamic? And do I need to use an allocator? And using those two booleans, uh, we, can, you can, we can, you see, we can actually uh, select uh, where and how uh, the things are going on, okay, there. There's a bit of work in progress there. So I'm only constructing an array from a shape if I use an allocator, because if not, I don't even need to have the shape. The shape is static. And so the storage selector basically does all the heavy lifting, basically takes all the settings again. So that's probably a, an opportunity of a refactoring over there. We ask the storage if it has to use an allocator or not, depending on all the options. And uh, if the size and the storage option are there, and we need to use an allocator, we will basically inherit from these dynamic storage things that still requires all the settings for now. Or we will use a static, a stack-based storage that only needs the types and the size thing. And so if we have a look at this uh, blah, 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 stack storage things, it's the most stupidest thing ever. So we take the shape, we ask him how many data he has, shove it into a std array. We do a bunch of type things of things. Okay, uh, we have this operator parents to access the element. We just basically say, I'm taking my strides, asking for the index and just going to the storage. I don't even know to go further because everything is static. 
So we have the size, we have the whatever, and so on. We have some swaps, and we just store an array there. So it's nothing fancy. And the dynamic storage is a bit more complicated because we have to deal with ownerships, and dealing with ownership is always an issue. Okay, uh, so we do all this computation about, I'm basically a view, except I'm not a view. I'm implemented as a view and the uh, private inheritance there. So I have everything a view has. I just need to manage my pointers. And for that, I need to know if my, uh, if my view is dynamic or not. So I just propagate everything the view does. And I have some kind of constructors. I need probably to de-zoom because I did some homework and wrote a bunch of dots there. So what should the default constructor do? Well, nothing. Well, nothing except if I decided to use an allocator while I was using a static size, because you may want to know your size is static. My array is 10,000 by 10,000 all the time, but you don't want to store it on the stack. So in this case, if you are not dynamic, you need to do some allocation instead of just being a null pointer because you know your size already. And in a symmetric way, when when should I be able to, um, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, copy something? I need to copy something uh, only if I know that I need, I, I can copy it properly. Same for the destructor, same for the, um, for the move constructor and so on. We just use this small check on that the, the dynamic status of the size to know what's what's going on, and so on and so forth. Uh, there we just cheat a bit, um, so we use the uh, copy and swap items to don't have to repeat all the static checks about should I copy or not, should I pre-allocate or not, and so on. I just copy something, swap with myself, and and return. That's that's a very cool thing to do. So we don't have to do all those things twice and so on and so forth. Uh, so we have a swap, we have everything, and we have a, a small perform copy, which has a, a strong uh, a strong exception guarantees using this unique pointer copy and then reset afterwards. So um, we just reuse the view interface. And instead of saying, yeah, the pointer is over there, we just allocate it directly into it. So we never store duplicate pointers. So that's very important also. And uh, if I can just basically uh, have a look at that, uh, if I go there, for example, oh, yeah, those are the smallest things we can have. Yeah, we, we actually, you know, yeah, we, we actually check those kind of uh, size of things. So, so as I say, this is something that I know the size is static, but I still want to store it dynamically. Okay, so this dynamic thing is just to say, okay, you, you need to allocate. And as you saw, uh, we are still, this is not the final version. We are still using new and delete. Uh, obviously these things uh, need to capture an allocator. Uh, and then we will just call the allocator instead. So that's, that's basically the same thing. So the one thing we check is that when we have a dynamic storage and context per size, we have the proper, the proper size for the thing. Okay, I'm like completely over. So <laughs> I, will, I will try to finish that quickly. Sorry about that. But I think we are pretty much, yeah, almost done. So we do this. So now we have the sub-indexing. I will try to do a bit, go a bit faster than that. So it was the uh, complete overload. So we want to extract subviews. And a good model for extracting subviews are um, what MATLAB does. So you can have extract data along the dimension, a subset, a subset with a step, so on. Uh, we don't care about the fancy Boolean and indirect indexing because it's a completely different thing. So we just focus on that. And uh, what we did is that MATLAB uses column things, but we can do. So we reuse this good old underscore things. So underscore one tree is basically one column tree is all the element between the one and the tree. Yes, okay. So uh, slides as uh, slicers as properties, uh, because it may imply that the slice you are looking at is contiguous or not, it's, it's a unit uh, step or not. And so we need to know what's going on. So what happened is that uh, every slice know how to compute the new size, stride, and starting point along a given dimension. And we will just uh, aggregate all those information to know what's going on and how to recompute the, the views. So we need to know if the stride, the slice, sorry, give us a unit slide again, and if the amount of data you will be looking at is actually uh, fully contiguous. 
Why? Because not being fully contiguous is not a problem by itself. You can have holes in your uh, in your views, but if you have all in your views, you cannot take a smaller views on this because it will not compute correctly. So we need to take care of that. And to do so, what we do is that we have concepts on also slicer that can tell us if it's actually a contiguous uh, indexer or not. So if you have an area of view and you use contiguous indexer all along, you get a view because the view conserves the uh, contiguous things. Now, if you use at least one slicer, which is not contiguous, you cannot have a view. You end up with a slice. And the slice is basically a view, except it does not accept a smaller dimension slicing. So if you have a, a 4D array, you can take a 3D view on it or a 5D view of it on it, no problem. Now, if you take a non-contiguous view on it, you cannot say, now, my slice, I want it to have only two dimensions because you will have holes. But you can ask for as much dimension or more. And what we do in this case is when we, we, we turn the slice, the indexing operator of slice just say, OK, I don't care if it's contiguous or not because I'm already doomed. But then I will check that the size is correct and that I have as much or more indexers on my dimensions. So that basically means that once you have these things, you have access to the shape and the stride. You can build an arbitrary view on this. So what you want is those things. So it's everybody on this dimension and one or every three on the other one. So the size is different. Okay, The stride is different, but we recompute it from the original strides. And we need to compute where we start. And the funny thing is that every element of the size can be computing knowing the full size of the data. And the, and the slicer on this dimension. So I have a 3.5 first, and then I go a 3.2 because I take everything on the first dimension, so the size is the same, it's still 3. And uh, on the other side, I go to 0 to 5 by jumping 3, which means 2. And everything can be computed this way. Once we have that, we can compute the stride and the starting point, and then we can access the view. And the, the fact that we use the basic stride things to do this just makes us that the stride things just help us getting free, uh, free slicing uh, out of nothing. So that's a cool thing. And then we can have ND-aware alloc alloc algorithms, sorry. Um, iterators and range on n-dimensional array is weird uh, because sometimes you can use them, sometimes you can because you, are, you can have holes in your views. So we went for another model that says that we have a notion of iteration space on which we will iterate and call some lambdas, like, like we do for regular algorithms. Uh, you can add whatever you want to add into this iteration shape, space. Sorry, I will go over that a bit later. So we can basically write stuff like this. So that's uh, n-dimensional forage. So uh, the forage takes some kind of function, which will be a, a lambda that takes a variadic number of indexes, and it takes a shape for now. Uh, later on, it has to take the uh, an iteration space, which is something a bit more complex than the shape. And we just recursively uh, generate four loops over all the dimensions. So yeah, I know I said that we shouldn't be doing this. Um, but indeed, uh, in this in these cases, it's the only thing we can do right now, uh, because uh, chaining four loops is not that trivial. So as long as we have this, um, uh, sorry, this ND uh, range things, uh, what we can have a look at is what kind of things uh, can, can be done. So uh, this is how you call it. Okay, so I have a view that come in. Um, and then I do this for each, and I say that for all elements in the shape of V, I, I compute these things, which is not very interesting right now. But the interesting thing is that without doing anything more than that, if we go to the uh, innermost loops, uh, well, it's, uh, it's it's exactly what you got if you were writing this by N and let the compilers uh, optimize it. So the compiler look, can look through that completely. So we got this nice uh, auto vectorized thing because the code is trivial there. And if you go a bit lower, we have all the uh, you know all the uh, unrolling of the of the tail. And if I do something stupid like let's use AVX five one two F or whatever, uh, save it. Yeah, okay, yeah. So it's even better than that because it recognizes that it's an A times stuff minus thing. So it just fuses everything. So we have the huge vectors thing there and then followed by 
uh, AVX things unrolled and then it's uh, SSE things unroll and so on and so forth. So this is a very um, rough uh, guess estimate we I, I tend to do is that if I write these abstractions and the compiler is, is able to see through it and still generate the proper vectorized or whatever you want code, that means that the abstraction is implemented correctly. It's, it's a very rough litmus test, but in my experience, usually uh, it goes right. So, so this is a cool thing. Uh, it's still not complete, as I said already, but we we have those fine things. So, let's let's finish this because I'm completely overboard. Sorry for that, Klaus. So, what did we achieve? So, we need a proper representation for engineering. We have this resting size problem that has to be addressed. Uh, we don't want to have huge uh, object lying there uh, storing nothing. Uh, we try to have a flexible API and, and type API also, and we show that we can have summary for free. Uh, we have this recursive descent of dimension as a basic skeleton for ND algorithms. It works in simple scenario. We, we are aware that it's not enough, uh, and we need to find a way to simplify slash uh, generalize, generalize this, sorry. Uh, and we have a lot of things to, um, to look at. So, um, you, you could actually have walked through adapters that let you walk through your N dimension using whatever uh, space filling curve you want. Uh, that's something that should be doable. Uh, you could also have uh, more complex subviews. Like you, could, you could have helpers that say, okay, give me all the, all the slices in 3D or uh, look, let me look at the view this way. Uh, we are trying to make it usable with our other library, especially the vectorization one and the allocator one. Uh, the idea is to directly use uh, polymorphic allocator models based on the Alexander Alexander School model of allocators. So we can have something that is far more flexible than the standard allocator. Uh, we can discuss that a bit later. And we are currently writing benchmarks on, on more complex cases, but the uh, actual QI we got from the simple thing is actually uh, encouraging on that. So uh, we are going to release that. Uh, we need to write some documentation as usual. Uh, I, I need to, to get a grip on that and do it on the fly, you know. But the uh, ETA is basically doing before four or during four actually, so two, three, something. Uh, I expect some of you may be interested in trying this out a bit later on. Uh, I, I expect to be roasted on what we did. Uh, I know it's not perfect, it's a completely uh, still open design. So we, we need to go further on that and we will be uh, very happy to get uh, feedback on that. So thanks for your attention and sorry for these completely overblown things. Uh, and so if you have any other questions, I can probably answer some now and before we jump onto the, um, the Zoom, right?